Hi, this is Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for watching my channel. Uh, this is not going to be a gun review or equipment review or something fun, I'm afraid. This is going to be the, uh, the answer to your questions about those regulations from the California Department of Justice, which have now been approved by the California Office of Administrative Law. In other words, California has spent a great deal of time and energy trying to restrict our firearms rights to the nth possible degree. I know because I sat through the <laughs> webinar by the uh, CRPA and NRA, and there's my stinking notes. My goodness. Talk about something that's, you know, want to put you to sleep or aggravate you to death. One of the two. I don't know which. Let me put my phone over there and get it out of the way. So anyway, I've boiled it down as much as I can. I'm not going to go through every little aspect of it. I will have a link in the description of the video that will take you to the webinars uh, for the CRPA. I've also covered some of this stuff in previous uh, videos, so I'll put that in there too. The Basically, DOJ submitted the same regulations this time that they submitted the last two times. Tr truthfully, there's so little changes, they're not even worth noting. But I want to confirm for you what has now become law. And we can say, if we want to, that uh, the Department of Justice does not get to make laws. But essentially, they did. There's a couple things they, they wrote into the regulations, which the legislature did not pass lawsuit pending, uh, and the Office of Administrative Law approved it. And of course, once they do that and publish it, then for all intents and purposes, it becomes law. Now, there are some lawsuits pending. There's some are actually going already that the NRA and uh, CRPA and others have already filed, and there are some that are in the works. So there's a lot of stuff going to be happening in the courts about this stuff. But let me run you through it uh, just so that you kind of get a feel for what you can do and can't do. And they're also, by the way, I'm very pleased with uh, the NRA and CRPA because they put together a little quick uh, reference guide. <laughs> Look at all the verbiage on that. And uh, better yet, for those of you, uh, if you're like me and I need pictures, uh, I need pictures. And you may, re may remember there was an old chart like this going around for long, many years. And well, this is the new one. And I put links in the description so that you can get this and download it. Uh, and you can actually see, try to figure out whether your rifle is considered an assault weapon in the state of California or not. All right, so let me go through some of this stuff here real quick that I learned on the webinar, which is quite long and, frankly, very detailed. And I'm very grateful for NRA and CRPA for putting these things together because the attorneys were actually able to explain some stuff. And I'm going, wait, what? Uh, so let me see if I can do it in English for you. First of all, there are some guns that don't need to be registered. Featureless, quote-unquote, featureless rifles don't need to be registered. California-compliant rifles, whatever those may be, those are also featureless, but there's other things that are just California compliant. And then the non-functional firearms. If it doesn't work, if it doesn't actually shoot, then it doesn't need to be registered. There are alternatives to registration. I don't plan on registering my uh, rifles at all. I'm going to make them featureless or compliant or whatever i got to do so that I don't have to register them. And I think by the time I get through this, you'll understand one or many of the reasons why. All right, here's some alternatives. You can modify the rifle, and that means you can make the firearm featureless if you like, which means you've got to take off the offending features, pistol grip, flash hider, uh, collapsible or adjustable stock or folding stock, forward pistol grip. You can't have a grenade launcher anyway. <laughs> Bummer, I want a grenade launcher, but they, they won't let me have one. Sorry, it's considered a dangerous weapon in the state of California, so you can't have one of those. Uh, so you can take the features off if you want, make it featureless, or you can uh, make it compliant by, you know, we'll talk about that in a minute, by uh, locking the magazine down or something. You can remove one of the prerequisites, basically, and make it California compliant. You can make it semi, you can make it uh, a single shot, so it's not semi-automatic anymore. You can change the rifle from center fire to rim fire if it's a rifle. So if it's an AR, you just put a different upper on it, make it a rim fire, problem solved. You can put a fixed magazine in it. That also solves a problem. We'll talk about some ways that you can do that and still have the rifle be functional here in just a minute. You can disassemble the rifle. And, and my understanding from listening to the seminar is that even, let's, like with an AR-15, where you have a, an easy way to separate the upper receiver from the lower receiver, even just separating those two makes it no longer a rifle because it's not. There's just two parts of a rifle, and therefore... It is not considered an assault weapon. You do not have to register it. But you got to remember, you once you take it apart, 
you cannot put it back together into any kind of assault weapons configuration in the state of California legally. Once you've taken it apart, can't put it back together. Now, the other thing is, let me get a drink here. Um, the other thing is that you've got to be very careful about what you say. Excuse me. I've been talking a lot today. Um, you got to be careful a lot about what you say when it comes to the parts that you have. There was a, a case, People versus Win, in which this gentleman had the parts necessary to construct an AK, and he knew that it was illegal to construct one, but he told the police when they came to talk to him that that's what he intended to do with the parts. He intended to take those parts and make them into an AK-47. And at the time, uh, with model make and everything else, that, uh, and still is, that particular weapon is considered an assault weapon in the state of California, and so it was against the law. They prosecuted him successfully for possession of the parts with the intent to manufacture and with the intent to possess an illegal weapon. Wow. Now, had he said, oh, yeah, I just got a bunch of parts, or had he said nothing and talked to his attorney and the attorney had told him to shut up, he probably would have been fine. But because he told them, this is what I intend to do, they actually prosecuted him for intending to do it, even though he never did. So be very, very careful if you have the parts necessary to put the gun together and make what California would consider an assault weapon if you're confronted by law enforcement. Shut up, say nothing, and uh, ask for your attorney. That's, that's what I would suggest that you do, and that's what the attorney suggested you do. But that kind of covers disassembly. All right, here's another option. Uh, if you don't want to register it, you can sell it or you can surrender it. You can surrender it to law enforcement. I would not personally advise that. Or you can sell it if you want to. If you're going to sell it in the state of California, you have to sell it to an FFL with a dangerous weapons permit. You have to sell it through an FFL anyway, but you've got to send it to somebody that's got a dangerous weapons permit because it's considered a dangerous weapon at this point. You can't sell it to somebody without that does not have that permit. So if you go to your corner gun store, they won't buy it from you if they don't have a dangerous weapons permit. Also, if you're going to sell it out of state and you're going to remain a Californian, you're a California resident and you want to send it to sell it to a buddy in Arizona, you cannot sell it as a personal sale, private sale in Arizona. It's against the law. You have to run the sale through an FFL in Arizona. I don't know why or how that works. I think it's an interstate transfer thing. But the only way you can sell it in a private sale is if you actually pick up and move outside of state and you move to a state where you can sell it as a, in a private sale and it doesn't matter. But if you're going to remain a Californian and sell it from California into another state, my understanding is you have to do it through a federal firearms license dealer. So there you go. If you want to do it legally. I mean, you can do all kinds of things illegally. This is all legal stuff. Uh, all right, fixed magazine definition. This is kind of important because this is where it, we, they kind of jacked up the bullet button on us. Uh, the new law states, and, and I'll put it up, put, I'm going to put this stuff on, up on the screen for you as I go so you can see it. The new law states an ammunition feeding device contained in or permanently attached to a firearm in such a matter that, in such a manner rather, that the device cannot be removed without disassembly of the firearm action. That's what the definition, if you want to call it that, of a fixed magazine is now in California law, which changed it uh, quite significantly because before, a fixed magazine was a magazine that had to be removed with a tool, could only be removed with a tool. And that's where the bullet button came from. Anything, a pin, the tip of a round, was considered a tool. Well, not anymore. Now, an, a fixed magazine is an ammunition feeding device contained in, in or permanently attached to a firearm in such a manner that the device cannot be removed without disassembly of the firearm action. Therefore, bullet buttons are no longer considered fixed magazine. It's not considered that way anymore under the new definition. You can, rem you, you can remove the magazine by the use of a tool with a bullet button, and that's not in the description anymore. So bullet buttons are null and void where that's concerned. However, I should tell you, and I'll remind you again, if you, re if you register your bullet button equipped rifle as an assault weapon, you cannot remove the bullet button after you've registered it. If you do, that's a violation. You cannot remove the bullet button after you've registered it from a register. From, if it's a registered assault weapon, you cannot remove the bullet button. That's in the statute. Uh, all right, you can disassemble the firearm action in order to remove the magazine. Well, what does that mean exactly? So disassembly, here's what they wrote as a definition. Forgive me, I've set my glasses around here somewhere. Um, 
disassembly of the firearm action means the fire control assembly is detached from the action in such a way that the action has been interrupted and will not function. And they give an example. This is very good in this one sense. It, it saves us trying to figure it out. This is the example that they give. Disassembly, disassembling the action on a two-part receiver, for example, like that on an AR-15 style firearm, would require the rear takedown pin to be removed and the upper receiver lifted upward and away from the lower receiver using the front pivot pin as a fulcrum before the magazine can be removed. So this seems like the aftermarket stuff, the AR mag lock and the various different devices like that would uh, tend to be within the California law and make your rifle California compliant because now you have a fixed magazine that can only be removed if you disassemble the action in a way that is described actually in the law. So can aftermarket products um, restricting the release of the magazine in the way that like the AR, AR mag lock and that kind of stuff, do those actually work and can they actually uh, make the rifle so that you don't have to register it? Yes. That would also apply to things like the elemental arms lower that you buy. And they actually have a jig now that you can, which I'm going to be doing a review on in a couple of days, uh, that you can actually apply to your existing lower. Uh, and they'll actually customize your existing lower if you want to send it to them. Uh, so any of those things that make it so that you have to pull or release the rear pin and tilt the lower up or tilt the upper lap, uh, up before you can release the mag, those all seem to fall within this description. And the attorneys said so as well. Same rules, by the way. I know somebody's going to ask. These same rules apply to AR pistols. You say, what about my pistol? Same thing. Doesn't matter. Uh, there's a difference with pistols we'll talk about in a minute, but it doesn't make it easier. It makes it harder. There you are. So AR pistols, same rules. All right, semi-automatic defined in these new laws. A semi-automatic must be fully functional and working as semi-automatic. It must not be missing certain necessary parts that allow the firearm to function in semi-automatic. For example, uh, if it's missing the firing pin, bolt carrier, gas tube, or some other crucial part, uh, and the firearm won't function in semi-automatic form as a result, then that firearm is not considered semi-automatic. A uh, fully functional firearm with a safety lock installed, like a, you know, whatever, to keep it from firing, the lock that you get from the dealer when you buy it, does not change its status as semi-automatic. I've had students ask me that. Well, I put the, you know, the safety lock through it. It's not semi-automatic now. Yeah, well, no, it is. <laughs> it's just got a lock on it. So that doesn't help you. Let's see, a couple other tips here. With regard to an AR-type firearm, if the upper and lower are completely separated from one another, it is not a semi-automatic firearm because it's not really a firearm. It's not fully assembled. It does not function. Likewise, a stripped lower receiver when sold in a California gun shop is not a semi-automatic firearm because at that point when you buy it, it's a stripped lower. What kind of firearm it's going to be has yet to be determined because you haven't built it into whatever you want to build it into. So you can still buy a strip lower, and you can build it into a single shot. You can build it into whatever you want. If you build it into a semi-automatic firearm, then it's going to have to be featureless because you did not own it prior to January 1, 2017, so you can't register it. But you can still do it, but it's either going to have to be uh, featureless or it's going to have to be in some other consider consig uh, configuration than semi-automatic. All right, this is kind of a bugaboo, and there is a lawsuit coming on a lot of this stuff, but specifically on this item for sure, and that is that the legislature did not change anything with regard to shotguns in any of these regulations, but the Department of Justice decided to write it in anyway, and now OAL has actually approved it. Well, they can't legally do that. The DOJ is not empowered to make laws. They're only empowered to enforce the laws the legislature makes. So... This is a law the legislature did not draft, and yet the DOJ included shotguns in these restrictions. Uh, so that now, now, in law, at least until it's thrown out by the court, which hopefully it will be, as of now, semi-automatic shotguns that do not have fixed magazines are considered assault weapons in the state of California. So there goes your Sega shotgun or whatever. You're going to need to register it or make it featureless or any of those other options. So there you go. That's a registered, that is a assault we an assault weapon now in the state of California. Not because the legislature did it. The Department of Justice just wrote it in, and OAL, for whatever reason, approved it. But I guarantee you there's a lawsuit on its way for that. All right, here's guns that will not be registered by the DOJ. I don't care what you do, how hard you try, you're not going to be able to register these. Assault weapons, unless you own them 
uh, prior to January 1, 2017, because you had to have them in your possession and own them before that. And if you if you do, then you can register it. If it's after that, you, you're going to have to make it featureless if you haven't already. Firearms that were required to be registered previously under the previous ban. Now, that's the Category 1, Category 2, and Category 3, I think, um, assault weapons under the previous California ban. Now, here's the thing. If you think that's what you've got, and it's the make model restrictions, you think that's what you've got, and you think you may not have registered it before, do not try to register it under this system. If you try to register it under this system, all you're doing is telling DOJ that you have committed a felony, you've confessed to it online, and that you have an illegal weapon. If that's what you think you've got, go get yourself a qualified attorney and get advice from that person before you do anything. Don't leap in there and try to register a Category 1, 2, or 3 assault weapon that was outlawed before and was supposed to be registered previously. They will not register at this time, but they will certainly will come knocking on your door if you try to register it, so don't do that. All right, featureless firearms. They're not going to register those. Firearms that have fixed magazines that hold uh, 10 rounds or less, your M1 Garand uh, or your or whatever, your uh, SKS, they're not going to register those. Firearms not fully assembled or fully functional. Firearms without serial numbers. That would be firearms that are that don't have a serial number because they're so old and the manufacturer never put one on it, or 80% lowers and you don't have a serial number on it that was applied and registered with the DOJ. Now, you may say, well, I put a serial number on it. Yeah, I get it. But there's a process you have to go through with those. You've got to submit a request for a serial number from the California Department of Justice. They send you that serial number that they've approved, and then you have to apply that serial number to the, the uh, receiver on the gun, and you have to do it a special way. It has to be so many, the, uh, such a, the type has to be a certain size, the depth has to be a certain, you know, I don't know. Anyway, it's kind of crazy, but that's what you got to do with 80 percenters and with guns that don't have a serial number. Until you do that, they will not register them, so keep in mind, keep in mind that's the case as well. Now note, the deadline for registration has been pushed back. Originally, you had a deadline to actually register the guns by January 1, 2018, but the legislature and the governor pushed that back because of all the, uh, the confusion and uh, fighting over the, the laws, uh, which has not stopped yet. It's continued, but now they actually are laws. So now you have to get it registered if you're going to register the gun by July 1st, 2018. It was previously January. Now it's July 1st, 2018. That's your deadline to register. All right, what else have I got here for you? Okay, the electronic registration system is up and running. Well, it's up. Well, it's there, but it crashes a lot. <laughs> it's not already. It's not really running. I mean, it's running. Don't expect it to run perfectly. It's new, and it has it has already crashed a number of times, from what I, I understand. Uh, caution: Do not attempt to register if you think you might be a prohibited person. I'm probably going to say that two or three times. If you think that you might be prohibited from owning a firearm, don't try to register one. Contact an attorney. You know, I'm really concerned about the fact that people are probably going to try to register guns not knowing that they're prohibited because they got something that they don't think is a big deal and they're not going to mention it. Then they're going to try to register it. And guess what? They've confessed to the possession of a firearm when they're a prohibited person. That's a felony. Or the people are going to try to register these guns that should have been registered before under the old ban, but weren't. Guess what? That's a felony. So if you, if you have doubts about any of that, please contact an attorney. You can run your own background to see whether it's, whether you're eligible or not. And uh, a good attorney or even the California Rifle and Pistol Association will give you some instructions on how to do it. And uh, there you go. And then you'll know before you, you put yourself in hot water by trying to register it through this system. In any case, you can see on your screen now the stuff that they're going to ask you for, uh, name, address, telephone numbers, standard stuff. What I thought was interesting is when you get down to hair color, okay, some of the options were pink, purple, green, orange. Uh, welcome to California. <laughs> Wow, really? Okay. Uh, the other thing is that as far as I could determine looking at it, you cannot register an assault weapon in the state of California if you are not a California resident. So if you're from out of state and you were thinking about registering one so that you could come into the state and you know shoot at a competition or whatever and have one here, you can't. So if you want to store a rifle here, have a rifle here, but things probably going to have to be featureless. Uh, you're not going to be able to register it. Now, here's some other things. Um, Oh, let me uh, let me get this up here. Joint registration. It there is such a thing as joint registration. You can register the gun 
with someone else, but there's some limitations as to what you can do and how you can do it. First of all, that person has to live with you. You have to live in the same residence, and you have to be able to prove that you do, and there's only certain ways to let you do it. Uh, and there's a whole list of ways, but it's in the application system. You'll find it as you go along. You must uh, be one of the following. It's got to be this kind of a relationship. You can do this with your spouse. You can do this with your child or your parent. You can do this with your grandchild or your grandparent. You can do it with your domestic partner, register joint registration, or you can joint register with your siblings, brother, sister, whatever. I don't know about nobody else. So cousin, whatever, those people are all. Uh, great-grandparents, you can't do it. That's the limit of it. That's it. And each joint registrant has to fill out an individual registration. So you're going to fill out your own individual registration, and then they, they join. So you have the joint registration of that firearm. And if you're going to have a registered gun and you got more than one person in the house, that's probably a good idea because otherwise, uh, if you're not around or that person wants to take it to the range, doesn't realize that they're not registered, it's not registered to them, then they're going to get arrested if they get spotted by a cop and ask and they don't have a registration with them. And that's going to put them in jail for... I, I'm, I'm just going to predict right here, right now, since the state has gone out of its way to make honest law-abiding citizens into criminals, that there's going to be a number of people arrested for stupid little violations of these idiotic laws, and they're going to get convicted of felonies, lose their firearms rights. I, I'm just appalled by this whole stinking thing. And I'm going to tell you, I, that's my prediction. I'm going to predict that right now. We're going to see that in the news. Some poor guy or gal is going to get arrested because they made some innocent little mistake because these laws are almost impossible to follow to the letter. And uh, some cop with a hard nose and some district attorney that is an, is a, an anti-gun Nazi is going to end up putting these people in prison. And I guarantee you that's what's going to happen. So mark my words when it happens. You can say, yeah, the gun guy said so, and he was right. And I, and I hate to say I told you so, but when it happens, I'm going to say I told you so just because I can. So there you are. All right, t with that in mind... Here are some potential traps in this whole goofy system. I can believe these. Here you go. Pistols can be assault weapons even if they are rim fires. So you got your AR pistol and you think, well, I'm going to make it a rim fire. It won't be, a, won't be an assault weapon. Eh, wrong. It will be an assault weapon because that's the way they wrote the law. Now, you can, put, you can turn your AR rifle into a rim fire, and it's not considered an assault weapon. But you do it with an AR pistol. Oops. That's an assault weapon. That's a trap, if you ask me. All right, here you go. Options to register include, when you're registering, going through the registration system. Here you go. Here's one of the options. Semi-automatic center fire with overall length of less than 30 inches. Wait, wait, what? Caution, trap, 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 trap. Those guns are already illegal, and they were required to be registered a long time ago. That is an illegal, that's, that's a, in fact, I think that's an NFA thing. Why would they put that in there as an option when they know the gun is completely illegal to begin with? Uh, be sure you don't check that box. That's all I got to say. Also listed are these, also traps. These are options. Short-barreled shotgun. Category 1 assault weapon. 50 BMG rifle. All of which are illegal in the state of California, and they've been illegal for a long time. So all you're doing, if you click any of those, is confessing that you've got an illegal weapon that you've had for a while. I guarantee you, you know, knock, knock, knock. Here's going to come the, you know, the black helicopters, black SUVs, and the, uh, the uh, stormtroopers from the Department of Justice banging on your door. Uh, what else? Let's see. Application asks the date acquired. When did you get it? When did you acquire the gun? And from whom? Okay, what if you got it a long time ago and you don't remember? What if you purchased it from a buddy innocently? You know, you got a hunting buddy and he wants to sell you his rifle, so you bought it and you didn't run it through an FFL at the time. And they ask you that and you tell them because it wasn't a big deal, you didn't think. You just confessed to a crime. That's a trap. I mean... Why do you put, if you're going to be, if you're the government, why are you putting booby traps in a system so that you can arrest law-abiding people? All right, here's some tips for you. <laughs> I'm trying to keep this short. I'm going to have links to these webinars and links to other videos. So if you want to watch the whole thing, you can. But, I mean, it was like almost two hours long, okay? And uh, I can't go that long in a video. So I'm trying to just give you the highlights here. I apologize. I can't go through the whole thing. But here's quite a number of tips for you to think about. First, don't wait until the last minute if you're going to register the gun because the system is full of hiccups, dead ends, 
things that don't work and so on. And if, if it doesn't work, you send pictures they don't like or whatever. The Department of Justice is going to call you and contact you because they want more information, or they're going to send you a letter because they want more information. Then you have to respond, and then you have to do it within 30 days. And, it, and if you wait till the last minute and you don't get that information in and they don't process it fast enough and, and the time runs out, you can't register that gun now. So if you're going to do it, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to register my guns. I'm going to make them featureless, or I'm going to take them down to Julio Zamaripa at Elemental Arms, and I'm going to have them turn them into the, you know, doll them up like the Elemental Arms ones where you got the little button on the back to, you know, to make the thing open up so I can, you know, I can remove my mag. I'm either going to make them featureless or compliant, I'm, I, or I'm going to take them out of the state. But I'm not, I'm not registering them. I refuse to do it. So there you go. I'm going to comply with the law, but I'm not going to register the guns. But if you choose to, make sure you do it in plenty of time because you don't want to run out of time. Uh, make mo mo if, you, if you register an assault weapon, make multiple copies of your registration and keep it with the gun at all times. Because otherwise you're going to be at the range somewhere and you're not going to have that. And some cop who, you know, look, a lot of cops, to be honest with you, I would say most of them are not gun Nazis. The overwhelming majority of them are not gun Nazis, but there are a few. And won't it be your luck? You'll be the one. You know, it's, it's just the way rotten luck works. You'll get the, the one who's the, the gun Nazi, and you're not going to be able to prove that that gun is registered because you don't have the document with you. Gun goes away, and they're going to they're gonna handcuff you and say, watch your head as you're getting the back of the police car, and then you got to sort it out afterwards. That gets pretty pricey when you start having to hire attorneys and everything else. And I guarantee you, here's the other thing. Once they have confiscated a gun, the chances of getting that thing back are slim, fat, and no chance at all, unless you want to spend a fortune on court fees to get it. And you're going to spend more to get the gun back than the gun is worth. So make sure you got many copies of that registration and you have one with the gun all the time. If DOJ contacts you for more information about your registration and they start asking you questions about where you got the gun, how did you get the gun, where did, who did you get the gun from, you know, stuff like that, shut up. Because they're going down the path of asking you questions about criminal things they think you did wrong. If they're asking you questions that don't feel right, you feel like they're, they're asking you things because they're trying to bait you into a trap or find out more information so they can arrest you, my advice is shut up right then, get a hold of an attorney, and, uh, and, and talk to the attorney. Don't, don't talk. The, the, you, all, you cannot talk your way out of jail, but you can absolutely talk your way into it, just so that you know. Uh, let's see. DOJ will do a background check on you when you apply to register an assault weapon. Did you know that? Yeah. So if you think, if you have, if you have even the smallest inkling that you might be a prohibited person, even if, I don't care if it was 20 years ago and you're wondering, well, maybe, um, don't try to register a gun. Contact the California Rifle and Pistol Association. They'll tell you if you'd like how to, how to do an eligibility check on your own. You can do it. There's a form, doesn't cost a lot, and then you'll get an answer. No, you're prohibited, or no, you're not. But you didn't do it trying to register a firearm, because if you're a prohibited person and you're trying to register a gun, you're confessing on the state system. On their website, you're confessing that you're in the possession of a gun when you're not supposed to be. So be very, very careful about that. Don't try to register a gun if you think you might be a prohibited person. That's no bueno. Uh, be very careful answering questions. The attorneys on at CRPA and NRA were very, these are a couple things they brought up. These are all their tips here. And I'm really grateful for them. Be very careful answering questions about 80% lowers that you want to register. Because if you inadvertently lead DOJ or law enforcement to believe that you paid somebody to finish that lower for you, rather than you doing it yourself, then... That person that you paid, and both you and that person have committed a crime of illegal, unlawful manufacture of a firearm, manufacturing of a firearm, and you've just potentially confessed to that or raised their, you know, antenna where that's concerned. So be very careful answering questions like, you know, where did you get it, who did you get it from, or whatever. You, you know, the answer is you bought it and you built it yourself. And if you don't remember where you got it from, you don't remember where you got it from. I mean, I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm just saying you can't, you can't tell them something you don't know. Uh, if you know, it, you tell them. But I mean, I, but like I said, I think a lot of times with this kind of stuff, at, get an attorney and shut up. That's my advice to you. Don't say anything. Shut up. Uh, that's what I'd be doing. You cannot remove the bullet button. I mentioned this earlier, but I wanted to highlight it here. You cannot remove the bullet button from a registered assault weapon. Don't do it. Once that gun is registered as an assault weapon, you cannot remove the bullet button. 
It is not yet clear whether you can actually change the furniture, change out the stock or, or the flash hider or whatever on a registered assault weapon. The attorney said they suspect that you can, but it's not clear. And so, because you've sent them pictures and you have to send DOJ certain pictures of this gun. Now they've got pictures of the gun. This is what they expect it to look like. And you've changed it around. I don't know if you, if you change it, do you have to submit new pictures? How, what's the deadline? When do you have to do that? I, I, what do the pictures have to look like? What do they have to cover? I, nobody knows. And the pictures, are their mandate for the pictures and what they want in the pictures is, is extremely vague as well. So I have a feeling a lot of people are going to submit pictures and then they're going to get back from DOJ. This picture isn't good enough. Okay, that's fine. Wh what, what do you want me to Look, when you think about the California Department of Justice, think about the meaner version of the DMV. <laughs> Don't expect a lot of sense to come out of it or a lot of cooperation, okay? They're going to make it as hard for you as they possibly can. It is not yet. Uh, let's see. Uh, I told you that. You can deregister an assault weapon after you've registered if you choose to do that, but it's, it's a bit of a process. And once you've done that, you've got to get it out of the state or you've got to make it featureless or whatever. And once it's not an assault weapon anymore, it's featureless, California compliant, or out of the state, yeah, you can take the bullet button off. But you can't do it while it is a registered uh, assault weapon. There is no addition. There, there are no. I mean, they didn't write any exceptions into this for law enforcement or retired law enforcement. So if you're, you know, out here, Leo out there, sorry about that, bud. <laughs> you're you're just like the rest of us. There you go. If you got to do want to do something with one of these things, you got to get a letter from your chief or your sheriff or uh, or your department or whatever. And if you're retired, you're like everybody else. I mean, that's it. You got no special privileges where this is concerned. All right, don't bring an assault weapon into the state. If you're out of state and you want to come here and shoot, don't bring that gun with you. Don't do it. There is a, a weird sort of really thin exception for people who are bringing guns in for competition, but it's so stinking narrow and so unclearly defined that I, I, I don't even know how it works. So unless you have an attorney involved that can navigate that for you, my advice is do not bring a gun that is considered an assault weapon into the state of California from out of state so that you can shoot with your buddies, hunt, or do a competition or whatever. Figure out something else or some other way to do it. I would not do that. A registration that happens when you buy a gun, this is a common question. Well, I, it was registered when I bought it. Yeah, well, no. The registration that happens when you buy a gun in the state of California is a completely, totally, utterly separate thing than assault weapons registration. So just because you bought it, you know, a month ago or three months, or you bought it, uh, you know, two months before the deadline ran out, you bought it in, I don't know, um, October of last year, yeah, it would be registered with the state as a gun, but it is not registered as an assault weapon. You still have to do that. They are two completely different processes two completely different things. Uh, let's see, what else? In order to register an assault weapon, you had to have owned it completely. It had to you finish process, the whole thing. It had to be in your possession. You had to own it on or before, actually not on or before, prior to January 1, 2017. You had to own it by the end of 2016, December 31st. If you didn't, then you can't register it as an assault weapon. You have to make it featureless, take it out of the state or whatever, if, or, or one of those other options if you want to keep it legal. You can still buy, uh, this guy get this question a lot. You can still buy stripped lowers. You can still buy them and you can build your own rifle, but it's got to be a featureless rifle to be legal, legal in the state. And to be legal, you've got to apply for a, um, a um, serial number from the state and apply the serial number. I don't think they'll let you. My understanding is you can't have, you can't legally build a gun without a serial number anymore. It doesn't have to be an assault weapon, but you can't legally build an 80% lower without a serial number anymore. Magazines. Let me touch on that very briefly, and then I, I'm, I'm almost through it all. <laughs> Are you still awake? <laughs> I'm not sure I am. Hey, wake up. You're missing the whole thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't resist it. All right, magazines. While the new ban on possession of magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, those would be the, the, uh, the, the actual real magazines that are banned, not the neutered 10-round ones. The, the current ban that they're trying to put through uh, to on ban on possession of those has been stayed by a federal court here in California. So right now, that it, it exists, but they can't enforce it. So if you've got legacy mags that you've got and you've had for a long time, and they're 30-rounders or whatever, 20-rounders, you can still keep those and you can still use them. However, you cannot put those in a registered assault weapon. That is a crime. If you have a registered assault weapon, you may not put more a, a magazine that holds more than 10 rounds into that gun. It is a crime. Let me say it again. 
do not put a, a, a magazine that holds more than 10 rounds into a registered assault weapon in the state of California. It's a crime. If you get caught, it's a big deal. Don't do that. You can use them if you want to. It's got to be in your featureless rifle or, col- or compliant California compliant rifle or whatever. That is my understanding. Don't put them in a registered assault weapon. All right, here's the other thing. Even though the possession ban that they tried to pass or did pass has now been put on hold by the court, the, or the laws that existed before restricting certain things about magazines that hold more than 10 rounds are still in place. And those are the laws that restrict uh, transfer. You can't sell it to somebody give it to somebody, buy it from somebody, get it from somebody, you know, if they give it to you or whatever. You can't transfer, buy, sell, or whatever one of those magazines in the state of California. You cannot manufacture one of those magazines without a manufacturing license in the state of California and without what they call a high-capacity magazine license in the state of California. That means you can't buy a parts kit and put the magazines together. That's illegal. You can't do that. You also cannot go out of state, buy them, and bring them into the state. That's importing. So there, there have for many years been restrictions on importation, manufacture, and transfer one way or the other of magazines that hold more than 10 rounds in the state of California. There has not been until recently an attempt to ban them that actually was successful as far as banning their possession. So it was always legal to possess them if you had owned them before the ban, but you couldn't do any of those other things. And, of course, nobody could prove that you'd done any of those other things unless you said so. So people left you alone if you were using them at the range or whatever, unless you're in a city or town where they have a local ordinance and then they confiscate them as a nuisance. And there's a few cities that do that, which they just know they can because you're not going to go to court over a $20 or $30 mag. Nobody's going to do that unless they get a lot of money, in which case they're not living in California if they're smart. But there you go. So those things still still exist. But if you have them, you can still use them. You can still take them to the range. You can still shoot with them and so on until it's all decided in court, provided you don't put them in a registered assault weapon. Don't do that. All right. I think that that covers all that crazy nonsense. There's a whole lot more to this. Uh, and if you are infuriated, frustrated, and made mad by all this, I get it. Me too. Uh, I'm not going to let my blood pressure get too high about it because, you know, I'm getting old. and <laughs> That's not a good thing for me. I'll just, you know, freeze up and keel over right here. <laughs> so we don't particularly want to do that. But uh, I, I'm very, very grateful that the National Rifle Association, California Rifle and Pistol Association, Gun Owners of America, Gun Owners of California, I mean, you know, there's a bunch of them. The Second Amendment Foundation, they're all stacking up and queuing up lawsuits over this stuff. And frankly... According to what the lawyers were saying, there's a whole bunch of legal fight opportunities in this kind of stuff because so much of it is uh, very, very poorly written and so much of it has holes in it. So I'm looking forward to those. In the meantime, so that you can comply, as I said, they've made some, they've made some quick reference guides for you so that you don't have to figure it out. And, uh, and this is one of them from the California Rifle and Pistol Association and the National Rifle Association. Look for that in the description. There's a link to this on the CRPA page. So you can download it. It's a PDF, and you can download it and print it out and share it if you want to do that. Uh, that, I think, is what I'm going to do, and I'll make sure we've got one of the local ranges so people can figure it out. That'll help you quite a bit, too. Thank you very much for watching. I hope this hasn't bored you to tears, and hopefully it's helped you, and we'll get back to shooting with the next video. Please, if you wouldn't mind, subscribe. I need all the help I can get, and I'm trying to grow the channel. And if you'd help us out by doing one of several things, or all of them, that would be great. Help us out on Patreon. If you sign up on Patreon, it costs you a buck a month minimum, and I mean, it's a, you can do it for only a buck. You'll see some extra content there. We've got a, um, a podcast, audio podcast we run twice a month, half an hour podcast. We've got a half an hour video podcast, which is a so- totally separate thing on separate subjects. Uh, some videos just for Patreon, uh, lots of posts and pics, and, and uh, we try to get back to you when you comment there real fast. And we got all stuff going on there for the premium content on Patreon. Please check us out. There's a link in the description. Join the NRA. They need all the help that they can get. And as you can tell, they're very involved now in California trying to get this stuff um, off the books here. And uh, they need your support. So if you would join them, that would be great. And I want to suggest that you check out Second Call Defense. They're a great company. If you have a gun, you ever use it to defend yourself and have to fight with it, you're probably going to need uh, some help in court. And Second Call Defense is the best company I've found for that. They front the money. It's not They don't just reimburse you after you've spent all your money trying to defend yourself. They actually front the money to bail you out of jail and... And uh, for the attorneys and everything else, it all comes out of their pocket, not yours. And you're, you don't have to pay it back. That's one of the reasons why I joined and my wife and I are both members. Anyway, thank you again. Have a wonderful week. I appreciate you watching the video. Please, please, please be safe. <laughs>